and I call, thank you, I, I call our second speaker, Dr. Hi, Juan Torres Rincon. Who good morning, everyone. Us. Good morning. So, okay. Morning. Nice to see you. Yeah. So Let please me share the screen. Is yours. Thank you very much. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So then I will start. Yeah, first, uh, let me thank uh, the Roman and the organizers for the kind invitation to present my, my work in this workshop and in particular in this session about the QCD critical point, where I'm going to show some of the, of the results that I did in collaboration with uh, Eduard Shuriak at Stony Brook University and myself, Juan Torres. So now in the previous talk already, uh, Xiaofeng just discussed the QCD critical point and the QCD phase diagram in general. Uh, and then I saw you here again with the, some of the uh, experiments, ongoing and future experiments, which are trying to uh, observe some signatures of the first order phase transition and also the possible critical point. So the comment I want to make here is that this uh, hypothetical critical point is located in, in the baryon rich region at finite uh, net baryon density in this phase diagram. And in particular, we know from lattice QCD that uh, this uh, possible critical point is favored for a chemical po biochemical potential of two or even three times larger than the critical temperature. And also some theoretical work but based on Dyson Swinger equations and functional normalization group, as we have seen in talks in this, in this workshop, it favors a, a critical point at four or even five times the critical uh, temperature. So it's really in this, in this area here where nuclear physics is irrelevant. In fact, this has been uh, used in the experiment to uh, try to measure some net proton observables. And in this case, Chaffin also saw this result from STAR about the uh, kurtosis of net proton distribution, where you compute uh, different cumulants of the net proton distribution and then do this ratio, fourth order cumulant, second order cumulant, and to get something called scale kurtosis. And this uh, is the result for the star, latest result from STAR data, where this kurtosis as a function of collision energy presents this kind of non-monotonous behavior. And this increase at low energies might be some indication of the presence of the, of the critical point. So uh, in this case, proton-proton uh, interaction should be important. And in, in fact, this kind of observables in the net proton distribution should contain some information about interactions among protons. So what is about the interaction about uh, two nucleons in general, or two protons in particular? Uh, well, usually we can modelize this with the boson exchange model, where two protons in this case can exchange different excitations, like a pion-like sigma excitation with different quantum numbers. And then uh, in this way, you can describe the, with some in a model way, uh, the interaction between two, two of these nucleons. Now, for the situations we are interested, uh, we, we have temperatures which are not uh, zero. They are temperatures which are of the same order of the vacuum masses of these states. So you expect for these states in particular, and also the nucleon-nucleon interaction itself, some medium modifications. So in particular, the question I would like to, to ask here is what could be the main effect, the main medium modification of this nucleon-nucleon potential due to the presence of a critical point. So, well, one has to go to the theory of critical dynamics, and we know that there is a mode, a sigma mode, which uh, is described in general by some effective uh, thermodynamic effective potential which you can expand in powers close to the critical point. And the main property of this uh, sigma field is that the mass is essentially uh, a measure of the inverse correlation length in the, in the QCD critical point. And you know that in such a point, this correlation length goes large, at least in the thermodynamic limit, so that the mass of this, of this particular excitation goes down uh, with some particular critical exponent. And here I show you some examples of different uh, effective uh, models, effective theories of QCD. This is 
this is for example the, um, the quark meson model and this is the linear sigma model the O4 model and the mass of the sigma is uh, indicated in both cases by an arrow so you see that the mass as a function of the chemical potential in this case and temperature in this case really uh, drops close to the critical point of each of these models. Now, uh, there was some interesting work by Misha Stefanov uh, almost 10 years ago, where uh, he proposed also to look at different uh, cumulants, not just uh, the, the mass term, so to form uh, different uh, ratios with these cumulants, and again, um, look at the kurtosis of the fluctuations of the critical uh, mode. In fact, that was one of the motivations, or the main motivation, to look for the kurtosis of net protons. Because as I told you already in the last slide, this uh, sigma is precisely coupled to protons. Yeah? So this uh, kurtosis of a sigma field will translate in kurtosis of net protons. So now, what happens when you take the two effects, like this mass dropping of the sigma close to the critical point, and then you combine with the nuclear-nuclear interaction? Well, this can be seen in a very simple model, of this one boson exchange, which is the so-called serot baletska model for the nuclear-nuclear interaction. It has, it's a very simple model, it has two components, some, uh, uh, some uh, attractive potential, which is here in, in blue, which is due to the exchange of the scalar particle, the sigma. And then uh, to describe uh, the, the small distances, you have the exchange of a vector particle, the omega, which is here in red. So then the first point is that the sigma is the one that controls attractive part of the potential. And in this model, which has been used to describe an infinite nuclear matter, what happens is that there is a large cancellation between the two terms. Yeah, you observe that these two terms will cancel to give a very shallow potential, not that shallow in this, in this particular parameters, but uh, uh, if more realistic version is something like this. But this is enough to give uh, a stable and bound nuclear matter. Now, of course, you can imagine that if, if there is an imbalance between these two terms, yeah, so this no, one is not compensated uh, with the other, then the physics will substantially be modified. So now is the question, what happens to this potential when you are close to TC? And this is what we uh, explored in, in a couple of papers. And the main idea is that this decrease of the sigma mass near the critical point is not compensated by similar modification of the repulsion. So then your effective uh, potential uh, between two nucleons or two protons will become deeper and will become long range as long as you are closer and closer to the critical point. So then you will get a net uh, attraction between two protons, and yet this will generate uh, necessarily proton-proton correlations. So here I illustrate this uh, modification of the potential. This is just for illustration. It's not uh, some particular calculation. It's simply using zero Baletska potential and then just modify by hand the different parameters of the potential. So here I just change the mass of the sigma by some factor. The, in any case, this mass cannot really go to zero, so the, the change is simply a factor of two in, in the mass square, and sometimes also modify the coupling itself, a similar amount. But in any case, you see that the effect is, uh, the supposed effect when you are approaching critical point is something like this. Yeah? In fact, in the final potential that I'm showing here, this is a factor of the mass, which is, should be something of the factor of three, something like this in the mass square. So then we explore what is the implications of this in the, in the dynamics uh, and in the context of heavy ion collisions. Now I should mention here a caveat uh, from a recent result by Edward, where uh, he saw that um, self-interaction of sigmas, so sigma, I, I remind you that sigma here also have self-interactions with some couplings, so this might, uh, even lead to repulsion of protons when you are very close to the critical point, okay? But only you need to be uh, really close to, to, the, to the critical point. So I will not uh, comment on that anymore. And then uh, focus on this nuclear-nuclear interaction. So then we explore this in some uh, simple model. So we did some molecular, classical molecular dynamics of a gas of nucleons interacting through this particular pairwise potential. Now we consider the system in thermal equilibrium. 
and the uh, conditions were conditions uh, uh, motivated by star measurements of freeze out. So we, in fact, because we are looking at the dynamics of uh, gas of nucleons and not anti-nucleons, so we were looking at conditions happening at low energies, so below the 19.6 GeV of collision energy. So this, more or less this part here, yeah, because we don't have dynamics of, of antibodies, as I said. So then, well, we're looking um, for this uh, molecular dynamics with the average, same average number of protons in some given kinematic cut. Well, we compute the kurtosis, the same kurtosis that it is measured as a function of the potential that we use. So here, the only difference is just we replace the potential between two protons. So here it's given in terms of two different kinematic cuts. So if you want to compare somehow with this experimental data by a star, you have to look at the open uh, circles here. But in any case, the point here is not really to compare. I, I do not dare to compare with experimental data because the model is a simple model. And in fact, I give here this um, point as a function of the potential. So you have to read this plot from the right to the left. And the idea is that you are approaching critical point essentially when you go from right to the left. So you have this increase of the, of the kurtosis, which could be a factor of, of three in this range. And if you compare or you just look at the numbers, you obtain similar numbers as in experiment. Okay, this does not mean that we explain the data, but this means that these results of simple model, although we use similar conditions at the start, have the same numbers as the experiment in this kurtosis, also uh, the increase of the, of the skewness, that is not shown here. So that means that the star data might be showing us the effect of this modification of the nuclear nuclear potential in this region. Okay, so then, if this is the case, what happens if you take this idea one step further? So will you not be able to create correlations uh, between, between nucleons, but you will also can form pre-clusters. So these pre-clusters, what we call uh, in this name, or pre-nuclei, if you want, there are uh, strong correlations of nucleons, like uh, collecting a group of, of nucleons, which are created close to the critical point until freeze out, but in any case, at temperatures of 100, 120 MeV. So these are mostly classical states, uh, which are bound simply by this modification of the potential. And these are broad states. I mean, they, they have uh, not a definite energy. They are broad because the, and the broadening, the width of these states are of the same order of temperature, which is non negligible And they should be characterized by some Wigner function in, in phase space. Now, these are not the same thing as nuclei. Nuclei are the final state particles that you measure in experiment, and you measure at temperatures close to zero. So they don't have this, uh, they don't have this modification of the potential. The potential is now the standard potential. And they are characterized by the wave function. Now, the thing is that these preclusters that can form due to the modification of the potential uh, form, uh, can be eventually uh, decay into ground state of these nuclei they must, might simply melt, they might simply decay into, into say, protons, protons, neutrons. But in any case, they, uh, well, you can assume that they are formed close to, the, to the, uh, these temperatures. And for example, I show you here some excited states of helium-4, that would be, if you want, like, uh, nucleon, I mean, four nucleon correlations, yeah, which are excite excitations of the, of the ground state, helium-4. And you find, this is experimental data in, in nuclear physics, and then you find many of them, like almost 50 of them with different quantum numbers. Of course, eventually these uh, states will decay, will decay into protons, into deuterons, tritons, depending on the decay modes and the, and the branching ratios. So now, with respect to these excited states of helium-4, if you are considering doing statistical thermal models, yeah, and then you want to describe light nuclei, uh, then you need to take into account these states because at those temperatures, you will also populate every one uh, of these states with the same weight. Of course, as I, as I told you already, they will account for feed down corrections. And they are not detected in experiment. We measure only the ground state, but you need to take into account in the analysis. Now, the practical implementation was done by uh, Bovchenko and collaborators this year. 
in, uh, and they found that these uh, effects of, of the excited states, not only helium-4, but also other nuclei, like nuclei excitations, is an effect, small effect at high, uh, say, high top SPS energies and rig energies of 5 up to 10%. But as long as you go down in energy, which is the interesting part, the effect could be as, as large as 60% for GSI or fair energies. So this should be important to take into account this excited state. Even in this case, there's no, uh, no modification of the potential. There is no critical point uh, going on in this analysis. So my message here is that would be even more important if the potential is modified due to the critical point. You will, form, you will have even extra production of these states and eventually uh, well, more, part, more light nuclei produced uh, eventually. Now, how to observe this effect when the uh, overall multiplicity of light nuclei is, is really low in general, right? Because you remember that you need to produce these states at some temperature, and then you have a penalty factor or a Boltzmann suppression factor due to the large mass of these nuclei. Well, the solution here is to look at ratios. If you consider this ratio, this is the number of triton protons over deuterons square, and this was already mentioned in the previous talk by Xiao Feng. So then I should mention maybe already now that this ratio was introduced uh, three years ago by, the, by this group here in the context of coalescence model, as Xiao Feng explained. Uh, again, in the same context of, of uh, in the same motivation with of the critical point. Okay. But if you take this, uh, if you consider now this ratio and assume that the statistical thermal model provides a, a good description, should provide a first order approximation, then you can replace the Boltzmann factor, numerator, denominator, and you will see that everything here that contains uh, energy is canceled, mass is canceled, mass of the nucleon canceled, temperature, chemical potentials, you only end up with a factor, with a number here, pure number within exactly the same number as, as in the coalescence model, 0.29. Okay, now you can measure this in the context of the statistical thermal model, when you take into account also the feed down of many states, not only, also, also including these excited states of nuclei, and then you observe this result as a function of the collision energy, or you can do the same as the, in the coalescence model. Yeah, and and Xiaofen also saw a different coalescence model, uh, transport, uh, this is JAM, uh, transport code. And then here is a, is a different one, but the, 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 the result is the same. Essentially, you get in all these approaches, and remember that they do not include any information about critical point or phase transition, you obtain a flat dependence in energy, almost flat dependence. Okay? Now, the value that you get, uh, this constant value is very different in the statistical thermal model and in this coalescence model, which is closer to this point 29. So, well, uh, this is something to be discussed. And in fact, I prepared some, some, some slides uh, uh, talking about, to discuss about this difference here. So let me not discuss right now and keep it for the discussion session. So, okay, what happens now if you would like to include the effects of the critical point? So then you have to account non-ideal effects on these uh, thermal model expectations where uh, uh, this ratio yes, is uh, modified by these factors. Then these factors are simply Boltzmann factors of the potential, nucleon-nucleon potential, which is giving you interaction, so the non-ideal part of the thermodynamics over the temperature. Now, if you allow me to do simplifications, you have three powers, two powers in the denominator, you get this factor. Overall, is this exponential factor of V over T. Now, what happens? If V is uh, negligible with respect to T, okay, you get ideal gas expectations. If this potential is of the same order of the temperature, because you are close to the, to the critical area, then you expect a non-monotonous behavior of this factor. You expect that this factor is one away from the critical point, either uh, small energies, large energies, as long as you increase the critical point, this will increase, uh, this factor will increase, perhaps a factor, say a factor E, if this is the same order, potential and temperature are same in order, there is a factor two, a factor of two or three uh, enhancement of this ratio close to the critical point. Then, okay, what happens in experiment? Well, this is experimental data. 
I, I don't have much time of discussing every every detail here, and let me uh, yeah let me not discuss uh, low energy and high energy, but just focus on these intermediate energies. So you observe here is data from a star, and also data um, extracted from any 49 collaboration, and you see this kind of a structure overall, which looks like a peak at some particular energy. In fact, if you compare the top point here at, at, 20, at 30 uh, GeV and the smallest point, which is the top freak energies, 200 GeV, you observe a factor of two of difference. Yeah? So then the question is, is this precisely the effect we are expecting uh, related to the critical point, and then we have a critical point in this area, or is something else? So now a way to test this idea is to consider the helium-4. And why is that? Helium-4 is four nucleons, two protons, two, two neutrons, and then you have six different distances. So you have six uh, powers of the interacting potential between each pair of those four particles. So now you can construct this ratio that I call O2, which involves helium-4, this alpha particle, and helium-3 in the denominator. And you do the same, the same calculation you obtain that every temperature chemical potential cancel here, you get a prefactor, which depends on the different spins, the energies of the states and relations between masses, and also these non-ideal factors. Yeah? This one coming from alpha particle, this one coming from helium-3, where you have three particles, so you have three potentials, and this one is coming from the deuteron, where you have two particles, proton-neutron, and then you have one interacting potential. So then overall factor here is the exponential of power of two times the nucleon-nucleon uh, potential over temperature. But uh, if you look at this ratio, this uh, that involves is more complicated, but in fact it's not because uh, for a good approximation, you can uh, simplify this triton yield numerator with the helium-3 multiplicity in the denominator. But this uh, ratio gives you another number, and then if you count powers here, this, uh, you will get uh, exponential of three times potential over temperature. So you will have the, the effect enhance a larger power than in the Triton yield. So then, okay, what you need to do here is to measure helium-4. But of course, helium-4 is very much suppressed, as you know, you, would, you can say that this, uh, you cannot uh, take much data of that because of the huge penalty factor. And in fact, this is true. If you look, for example, at high energies, this is the point here for Alice. Yeah? And you see that this uh, helium-4 multiplicity compared to the proton multiplicity is 10 to the power of seven, minus seven. Yeah? This is really much suppressed. But what happens is that as long as you decrease collision energy, this uh, ratio increases, yeah, increases so rapidly. And in fact, when you are at the low energies, and these are experimental data from FOPI, at these low energies, the ratio is not that it's small, but it's not that small, not negligible anymore. So for the interesting region, uh, where the critical point might be located, then the production of helium-4 is not negligible. And then it uh, should be possible to measure uh, this state. So, okay, so now the, the point is, of course, there is no, right now, uh, there's no experimental data, at least that I know of, in this in intermediate region. So the only thing that I can show you here is an estimate for these ratios, O2 and O3, uh, using the Triton ratio as a, the experimental values of the Triton ratio as an input. And to do that, uh, what I will use is a technique, a simple technique, which is called the Flucton, Fluctum solution of the path integral, which is a method that Edward derived in the late 80s, yeah, introduced for, for quantum mechanics. And here I applied this method uh, to, to finite temperatures and also to two, three, and four particle systems, not just one particle in a given potential. Now, this is the case. I don't have time to, to explain much, but uh, yeah, let me give you some. I have a couple of minutes. Uh, let me explain here uh, what is this. Basically, I consider two, two particles interacting through this potential here. This is the Valeska potential with some parameters. And then, uh, essentially, you write down, you go to Euclidean, uh, Euclidean, uh, Euclidean time, and then you construct the action, in the uh, Euclidean action for this uh, system of two particles. Now, you restrict 
you separate the center of mass motion to the, to the relative distance, and you solve the path integral in the semi-classical way. So you take the classical uh, solution of this action, and this is at finite temperature, yeah? And this is what is called the fluctuant solution. Now, the fluctuant solution is used to create the, a probability distribution, like this, of the, dist of the mutual distance of two particles. Yeah? That will give me the probability that two particles are, are located at some particular distance between each other. Now, you can compare this with the classical expectation. The classical expectation is simply the Boltzmann factor of this potential. And I, I plot here different, different cases. Uh, I, well, I mean, these, these are different temperatures where I compare the classical expectation to this uh, fluxton case. But you observe when the temperature is large or the potential over temperature is negligible, you obtain good agreement with the classical version. But when the modification of the potential is large, or in this case where the temperature is small, you get differences. Yeah? And these are simply quantum effects. These are quantum effects that are taken into account in this fluxton solution and not in the classical version. So now the, the point is, is the following. I take my experimental data from the Triton ratio, use this fluctuant method to gauge how, is, how much is the modification of the potential for each of the points of this ratio. In fact, I have this potential, which is uh, analytic, and then everything depends to the sigma uh, excitation mass. So once I, I, can, I can do this, because I have this probability, and the probability allows me to compute spatial averages and these spatial averages are the thing that I need here, okay? So then I can do this, and then once I know the modification of my potential, then I go to the new ratios and compute uh, an estimate to an estimate for this ratio, so two and O3. And this is the result. In the left uh, panel, uh, this is the ratio O2. And if you uh, focus in this intermediate region, you, I mean, the, the trend is similar, the qualitative form is similar as in the Triton ratio, but you observe that the effect is now uh, a factor of two more than uh, in comparison to the Triton ratio. So the top point and the lowest point is a factor of five. If you go now to the third ratio, you obtain this form, again, similar form, but the effect is a factor of 10. So then with these ratios that involve now helium-4, you enhance the effect a factor of five with respect to Triton. And the only assumption here is that the whole effect is due to the modification of the potential close to the critical point. So that would be a test to test precisely this, this hypothesis. And, uh, and of course, my message here for experimentalists is that we need measurement of helium-4. Yeah, we have the results for Deuteron, Triton, and, uh, at RIC as well, and NA49 collaboration, but we need also measurements of helium-4. So this brings now to my, to my summary already. And then, uh, well, the main idea is that there might be significant attraction and a long-range interaction between two nucleons close to the critical point. And this fact, that would lead an increased correlations between nucleons in general. And in particular, that's will, this will affect net proton and proton distribution probability. And you, uh, this can, of course, be showing, so can be, can be seen, should be seen in, in cumulant or kurtosis measurements. This can also lead to formation of pre-clusters or correlation, statistical classical correlations of nucleons, which will populate excited state, states of light nuclei, and, and for example, helium-4, which will later, at the end of the day, they will decay to the ground states or other kind of uh, decay products. And finally, this, uh, if this is the case, you will have an enhanced production of light nuclei at the critical collision energy. And a way to test this is to do light nuclei ratios. In particular, the one I propose here is the one involving helium or two involving helium-4 to test if, this, if there is some kind of peak or not in this uh, ratio at some particular energy. And with this, I, I finish my talk and thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. We have time just for one short question. I, I've seen a couple of questions in, in the chat, but just one question. Okay, Professor Blaschke, please <coughs> go ahead. But very, short. very inspiring talk. 
I have just one question, which is related to old uh, studies by Rab Wambach and uh, Chuk um, in the middle of. The there is, um, there is, they studied the effect of two pawn exchange between nucleons on the stability of nuclear matter, and they found that, in particular, when this um, effects on this accumulation of strengths in the uh, S wave channel uh, gives uh, some overestimate of the attraction if one does not uh, take into account constraints from chiral symmetry. And they did that and demonstrated this. So my question is, did you also consider uh, um, constraints from uh, chiral symmetry in the nucleon-nucleon interaction? Yeah, uh, th thank you, David. I don't really know this, this word you are mentioning, so I don't know which kind of constraints are, are I can those. Send it to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess probably I, I, I don't think I, I, I use that constraints because I don't know. Maybe later, please. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, thanks again to the speaker. Thank for you. a very impressive talk and we should